the next session of the Brunel Research Festival, Modernising Elections and Delivering Electoral Integrity. Uh, just before we start, we're going to record the session uh, and it will be available afterwards on, on the Brunel Research Festival website. So I'd just like to introduce uh, the session to everybody and then we'll pass over to our first speaker. My name is Justin Fisher and I'm part of the Open Data Analysis in Social and Political Science Research Group. Um, we have three members of the group here today uh, showcasing our specialisms in modernising elections and delivering electoral integrity. So I'm delighted to welcome my colleagues, uh, Dr. Manu Savani and Professor Jeffrey Karp. So we're each going to speak for around 12 minutes and then there will be plenty of time for questions afterwards. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Manu. Thanks very much, Justin, and uh, welcome everyone. So uh, I'll be talking about um, some work that Justin and I have conducted recently, looking at online voting, i-voting, and what people make of it, public attitudes towards that. So just to dive right into the context, um, we know that voter turnout has been declining steadily over time, and this has prompted governments to try out new things to reverse that trend. So different innovations, one of those is postal voting, which I think we're all familiar with. And it's now quite popular, reasonably popular in the UK. About a fifth of voters in 2019 voted um, by post. But there are still some concerns around that, um, for example, electoral fraud. So one further solution, another innovation, might come in the form of online voting. Now, this is... Um, specifically remote online voting that I'm talking about, which is not where you go to the polling station and use a computer there, but you could use your own device at home or wherever you might be, so a phone, a tablet, um, and that's what we mean by i-voting. So why might that be a solution? Well, it further um, reduces the costs to the voter. You don't have to travel anywhere on a set day or at a set time. Um, potentially it reduces the cost of collating and, and counting the votes. Um, it has the potential perhaps for stronger electoral integrity in some contexts. And it might also encourage more participation from uh, socially excluded groups, those with a mobility impairment or younger voters who we know in particular do have um, a lower turnout. So with that in mind, it's perhaps not a surprise that um, there have been a number of trials around the world. Um, and what, what you're seeing there, if there's a country shaded in green, that means a trial has taken place. Um, and as you can see, there's, there's a wide range there, all the way from Armenia to Panama and the United States. Um, although a number of countries have trialed, many of them have not taken forward i-voting after they've, they've tested it out, and that includes a number of European countries. Um, and in fact, in Germany, it's, there's actually been legal ruling against it, the same in South Africa as recently as 2021, based on concerns about fraud and, and whether um, i-voting may indeed deliver the integrity that it promises. But there are a few countries who have um, adopted i-voting. One of those is Canada. Um, it's only at a municipal level and only some municipalities, but evidence from there suggests that um, to turnout has increased and um, participation has gone up by about 3.5 percentage points. Um, it's also been tried and is uh, being run in Switzerland, um, but only in three cantons. So again, it's not widespread. Perhaps the country that is um, the front runner in this, where I voting is most prominent, is Estonia, uh, where 44 percent of uh, voters used remote online voting in 2019. Now, as you can see there, the UK is also shaded in green, and we have had our own um, trials and experiments with this uh, between 2000 and 2007. But again, like some other countries, we didn't um, go forward with it. More recent data, qualitative data, and um, collected by the Electoral Commission suggested that um, voters were perhaps curious, but they still cited a few concerns, including digital literacy, um, uh, coercion perhaps of voters, and also data anonymity. So all in all, there, there is some openness to it, um, but it's not something that's been widely adopted. 
However, the pandemic has shifted so much of our lives online, um, and that really prompted us to consider whether things might be changing in terms of how people feel about iVoting. And that has prompted uh, our study into this, and we framed two questions. One is about what makes voters more or less likely to want to take part in iVoting. And are there differences across groups? Are there some people who might be more willing to try it than others? Now, this study um, has taken place. It's been published in the British Journal of Politics and International Relations. And if you're interested, please do have a look at the paper for more detail on how the research was done and what we found. But I'll be giving you a summary of it, of it here. So let me tell you a bit about our starting point was really what do we know so far. And we did have... Um, some prior research that we could draw on. Um, and essentially, if you take a cost benefit approach to this, you can imagine that if I voting reduces the cost to the voter, um, it can increase turnout. And that was really kind of the core logic. Um, but there are other things that matter as well. So this can vary across people um, depending on their individual characteristics, age, income, education, gender, but also their political attitudes. How engaged are they politically? and also trust in the internet more generally. And the finding was that if you use the internet more, you're more likely to vote online, which is all very plausible and intuitive. So that's what we started with, but we wanted to dig a bit deeper into this um, and also ask whether it matters who is in charge of the iVoting. So if it's a public sector organization or if it was a private sector firm, are there differences there in public attitudes? We also wanted to go beyond just levels of internet usage to understand more about attitudes towards risk um, and data privacy. So with, with, this is really where we wanted to make a contribution. And we set about answering these questions using an online survey, an online survey experiment. Um, this was run with um, just under 2000 participants um, using the polling firm YouGov. And all participants who, who signed up for this project, they are under um, they had some baseline survey questions, which essentially got at uh, some more information about them. So all of those factors that I just showed you, we're trying to get at individual characteristics, political attitudes, that kind of thing. But then importantly, they were given three different messages, three different vignettes. And the control group were simply introduced to, this is what I voting is, there's a few countries that have been doing it. The treatment groups that we're particularly interested in were given a bit more information about the advantages of iVoting, and they were also told who would be involved in delivering it. So the first treatment group were told it's a public sector organization. The second group were told it's a private sector, there's a tech firm. So what we're interested in here is comparing um, how willing are voters to take up I voting based on the message that they saw? And because they've been randomly assigned to these messages, any differences in that willingness to vote online can be attributed to the content of those messages. And that's where the experiment comes into this. It's a survey experiment. I'll show you now what we found. Well, actually, no, first I'll show you what the messages were in for each of those groups. So as I said, the control group gets uh, basic information. Um, in re referring to the upheaval of the past year, this was fielded uh, in 2021. So this is referring to um, pandemic and pandemic policies. Um, so with that as con context, we've said that there's uh, online voting systems available. The UK could look to develop its own version. And we've mentioned there about the accessibility. So that's what the control group see. The first treatment group get that same information, but they get a bit more as well. So they're told who might be involved, and that's the independent body like the Electoral Commission. So that's our public sector side. And we're also giving them a bit more information about the potential advantages. And here we've specifically highlighted it reduces public health risks because people don't have to congregate and come together in person. With the other treatment message, very, very similar, same context as the control, same point about the um, accessibility and public health, but that middle um, statement is a bit different there. So we don't refer to the Electoral Commission, we refer to a well-regarded tech 
company. That's the key difference between the treatment groups. So what does that mean to voters? Um, well, um, we ask them, what is your willingness to vote on a scale of zero to 10? And we, you know, higher up the scale, 10 means very willing to vote, zero means not at all. So we're looking to see where do they land based on the information they saw. We also gathered information about their use of the internet, the, um, the digital risk that they're already exposing themselves to, and those other characteristics um, that I mentioned before. So here we are. Um, so there's a few things to take away from this um, graph. These are our headline findings. So we've got on the scale of zero to 10 there how willing people are uh, to vote online. And I suppose the first thing to say is that in general across the sample, there is um, quite a, a reasonably high degree of willingness. So on a scale of zero to 10, we're somewhere between six and seven as an average. So that may or may not surprise you. I thought that was reasonably open to the idea, given that we don't do that widely in the UK. But the, interested, um, the interesting findings here, I suppose, are really in between these, these groups. So the control group we can see are at 6.56, and the public sector group are slightly higher at 6.89. And this looks uh, like a modest effect. It is a small effect, but it is statistically significant. And even these small changes um, could translate to, to uh, significant differences in the field. So this is a significant finding. And what it's telling us is that when people see that bit more information, they are a bit more willing to vote online. But what's super interesting is that it does matter who they hear about. Is it the public sector or the private sector? Those who saw the private sector information are actually um, slightly less, although it's not statistically significant, slightly less willing than the control group, but significantly less willing in statistical terms than the public sector group. So those are our kind of main findings. And what that tells us is there is this um, positive and statistically significant um, effect from knowing that an independent body is in charge. That extra information we gave about the advantages, the reducing of public health risks, all of those points, they're not actually as effective. What's really impactful is this information about who runs the ballot. We were also interested in looking across um, our sample and seeing, you know, are there differences between groups? We did find that there were some differences. So as expected, voters who have more access to the internet and use it more, they are more willing to vote online. But again, for them, it matters um, if the public sector organization has been mentioned, they then become more willing to vote online. Even those who initially had a um, slightly higher level of concern with eye voting based on the risk, even they become more willing to vote online after they see mention of the public sector. So there's a pretty strong um, overall theme here, which is that who delivers the elections really does matter. We also find that in thinking about um, this heterogeneity, the differences across our sample, we do need to look at risk. And the way we have done that, looking at data privacy as a representation of risk is a useful way forward. So that is, um, in a nutshell, what we found um, relating to iVoting. And just to tell you a bit about some current work that's going on, um, we, Justin and I, are working with our colleague, Dr. Botios Spiridonis in the Computer Science Department at, at Brunel. We are looking now to um, develop a prototype voting app to delve deeper into how do people feel about this experience. So we have designed this um, a prototype and we recently tested it and asked people when you have a go with this and in a mock with a mock ballot paper what is it you like about this is it convenient is it intuitive do you prefer using a smartphone over a say a laptop um so we're looking into that and trying to understand once they've actually played around with this kind of thing and you know it's become a bit more real um does that change um attitudes towards i voting and again might there be any differences between subgroups of voters so that's um, some work that we are currently doing, and we're hoping to produce a report about that later in the summer. And there's broader questions still that um, we think are important to address. Um, and that would include uh, the following. So looking at you know, the mix of actors, because we know in reality, it's unlikely to be just a public sector or just a private sector and um, firm involved. We think there will have to be a mix. And so what is that optimal mix as far as the public's concerned? 
And we also know that things are changing. So we think it's important to track how do attitudes change over time? And coming back to the start, that big question, if this was to be applied in the field, might it improve turnout? And with that, I'll stop there. Great, uh, thanks very much, Manu. Um, so we're gonna move swiftly on to the next paper uh, and uh, we, we will take questions after all three papers at the end. So the presentation I want to make is about some work I've been doing on electoral integrity, looking at evidence from British general elections. Now, what do we mean by um, electoral integrity? Well, the first thing to, to uh, stress is that the question of integrity, the uh, how safe our elections are, if you like, has formed the basis of something that was introduced by the Elections Act last year and was first used in the local elections at the start of this month. Namely, uh, that voters now, now have to provide a form of identification uh, to be allowed to vote. Previously, you simply it was simply based on trust. Now, the basis for the uh, introduction of voter identification was that there were concerns about um, what we call personation, uh, people impersonating other voters in order to vote on their behalf. And uh, although many people argued that the number of cases for that uh, suggested that there wasn't a big problem, uh, it was nevertheless introduced. And so all voters uh, now have to have voter ID. But what we also mean more broadly about electoral integrity is both uh, what we call negative and positive. So negative electoral integrity is where there are issues of fraud or people perceive them to be and malpractice. But also there's positive electoral integrity where people think elections are well run, where the result is credible and where it is properly competitive. So uh, what I'm seeking to do is test whether or not there is a problem with electoral integrity and whether or not it is uh, widespread, as the Elections Act seemed to indicate. Now, how do we get at these measures? Well, typically, um, most studies of electoral integrity are based on the opinions of three different groups. The first is what we call expert surveys. Uh, these are people who evaluate how well elections are run in their own country, typically academic uh, evaluators. Uh, and these large scale surveys are published by uh, projects like the Electoral Integrity Project. A second one is electors. Uh, these are people, uh, these are voters, obviously. And typically here we get answers from uh, people who are voters uh, in a survey. Um, and what we find with a lot, a lot, of, the, a lot of these surveys is that people's perceptions of fraud and negative electoral integrity are actually quite high. In the UK, it's about a third of people think that there's some electoral fraud. The third group is electoral administrators, the people who um, run elections uh, uh, within local authorities. Um, there, as we might expect, perceptions of fraud are rather lower. They're closer to the process. And we can think of these groups as being um, electoral evaluators. These are the expert surveys, electoral consumers. These are the electors and electoral producers. These are the administrators. What this study does um, is look at a fourth group, uh, which has not previously been researched. And these are electoral agents. And I call these people electoral users. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with uh, British elections, um, what an election agent is, is, is firstly, it's a legal necessity. So all candidates must have an electoral agent, and that person is legally responsible for all the spending that a candidate does and the conduct of the campaign. So if a candidate is uh, challenged in terms of their election spending, for example, as, as has happened in the past, the agent is also liable. Now, it's the reason we look at electoral agents is because these people are running campaigns and therefore, um, like uh, electoral producers, they're like they will have a well informed view of the quality of electoral administration. Um, and therefore, they're pretty well placed to assess, assess both positive electoral integrity and negative electoral integrity. Now, 
it's worth stressing, as with all of these groups, that these assessments are perceptual. Okay, They are what people perceive to be the case rather than what may actually be the case. But because agents are close to the process, uh, our assumption is that their perceptions will be more accurate than perhaps electoral consumers. So this is our research question. Uh, what factors help predict evaluations of electoral integrity as measured by levels of satisfaction at, with electoral administration and perceptions of electoral fraud? And what you can see there is that we're, we're using both uh, evaluations of positive electoral integrity, levels of satisfaction with administration, but also negative electoral integrity, perceptions of electoral fraud. So um, we look at three different groups uh, to try and predict why perceptions are as they are. And broadly speaking, these are broken down into agent characteristics, geography, and electoral competition and outcomes. So in terms of the agent characteristics, here we expect that the party for which uh, someone is an agent uh, will matter. And the reason for that is that in studies of particularly of voters, uh, there has been a finding that voters uh, who support more right-wing parties are generally more likely to perceive electoral fraud. So we're kind of interested to see if that's also true of agents. Secondly, there's agent experience. So if you've organized uh, more than one election campaign, you should have a better understanding of the process. So we would expect that more experienced agents would have a more positive view about how elections are run. In terms of geography, we can look at variation by country within the United, uh, within Great Britain. So we're just looking at England, Scotland, and Wales. And this is partly because some previous studies have shown that electoral integrity seems to be stronger in Scotland, but also because um, elections are administered on a sort of quasi-federal basis with the Electoral Commission who oversees the whole thing being broken, uh, having uh, key offices in Scotland and Wales, as well as in London. But then we also look at urban characteristics. We're interested to see if you have any variation depending on whether a seat is more or less urban. And this reflects the wider literature, which suggests that three different characteristics of, 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 a, of an area are likely to um, uh, lead to greater or, or lesser uh, judgments about electoral integrity. Now, all of these three, these population density, the level of ethnic diversity and the size of the rental sector, are characteristics of urban environments. In many ways, they're measuring broadly similar things. So we use a scale that captures all three aspects to, to, uh, to capture what we call urbanness. Finally, we look at uh, electoral competition and outcomes. And we expect that perceptions of electoral integrity will be affected by how competitive a seat is, how marginal a seat. Because in more marginal seats, people have more investment and therefore uh, they're likely to be more strongly attuned to whether something is awry with the process. But then finally, we look at something that's very prominent in the literature, what we call winner-loser effects. In effect, what you find in general is that people who lose elections tend to be more negative about electoral integrity. And that's particularly the case if they are committed partisans, very strong followers of party and agents are likely to be that. So these are our hypotheses, that um, the evaluations will be a function of party affiliation, they'll be affected by agent inexperience, there'll be a function, of, uh, a function of the country in which the election takes place, that they'll be more negative in more urban areas, that it'll be more negative amongst electoral losers, and will be more negative in more competitive electoral contexts. So what are our data? Uh, these are data we've carried out of uh, uh, surveys we've carried out of electoral agents immediately after 2010, 2015 and 2017 British general elections. And we focus our data on the three GB wide parties, Conlab and Lib Dem, simply because we want to get variation by country. So we wouldn't look at the SNP or Plaid Cymru. Uh, 
And we expect to see people who have higher levels of satisfaction also having lower levels of uh, lower perceptions of electoral fraud and vice versa. In other words, if you're positive about satisfaction, you should, we expect you to be negative about fraud. But that's an empirical question that we're going to test. Well, this is what we found. We found that actually, as with the uh, voter level surveys, it is supporters of the centre-right party, in this case the Conservatives, who are more likely to perceive fraud. In truth, we don't know why this is, but this is in common with studies from Australia and the United States, for example. In terms of agent experience, there was much less of an effect. We only found one isolated case in 2010 where less experienced agents were more likely to perceive fraud. But by and large, agent experience didn't make so much difference. In terms of country, we found regular country effects, although they were not completely consistent. But generally speaking, what we find is what other studies have found is that in Scotland, there is generally more electoral integrity or perceptions of electoral in stronger perceptions of integrity than in the rest of Great Britain. In terms of the urban environment, we see, we see very strong effects. We see clear effects that in more urban areas, there is less positive electoral integrity and also more negative electoral integrity, just as we would expect. In terms of winner effects, winners are more likely to be satisfied and less likely to perceive fraud, as we might expect. And in terms of marginality, we see some impact in respect of fraud, but none in terms of satisfaction. So to conclude, the three things that makes uh, a consistent difference in terms of uh, uh, electoral integrity are whether you win, which party you represent, and the urban environment. In other words, whether your election is in an urban environment or a more of a rural one. Secondly, what this demonstrates is that questions of electoral integrity vary strongly across the country and the effects are far from uniform. And thirdly, what we find is that actually it's not just about whether you win or not, uh, whether, you, uh, whether you're satisfied with the process, but also geography matters, as do partisan cues. And what this suggests, coming back to the first question, is that actually the concerns about widespread electoral fraud, which led to the introduction of voter identification, seem to be misplaced. If these judgments are correct, it would seem that any concerns about electoral integrity are fairly isolated and concentrated in uh, particular seats. So um, with that, I'm going to pass on to Jeff. Uh, who is going to talk uh, about another aspect of electoral integrity. And Jeff, you should now have control of the screen. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to just start my video here. Hi there. <laughs> uh, and well, thanks, Justin. Uh, I think I'm going to, my discussion kind of follows nicely from, from yours. Um, uh, I'm I'm looking at a similar question, uh, but in a different context. Uh, so um, I'm uh, interested in uh, this question about electoral fraud and, and to what extent can we attribute it to any uh, specific factors. Um, and I'm also interested uh, in the extent to which it's linked to winning uh, and losing. And, and finally, I um, uh, wanted to examine uh, the consequences uh, of this in terms of uh, political violence. So this is a, a project that I'm uh, working on with a former um, grad student of mine who's now at uh, USC, uh, Marshall Garland. So uh, let me just see how to advance. <laughs> uh, right. Um, see if that works. Okay. Uh, so um, I have several sort of related questions, although they're they're linked to, together. Um, one is uh, what shapes concerns about electoral fraud? Uh, so, um, and I'm looking at this in the context of the United States, uh, where um, 
where the subject or the topic of fraud is quite a salient issue, uh, particularly uh, because uh, the former president of the United States had raised it uh, not only in the context of his reelection uh, campaign, um, but also in the context of a number of other elections that took place in the United States. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to examine what arguments or what concerns uh, about electoral fraud had the most resonance with, uh, with voters. And linked to that uh, is a question of whether or not uh, losing an election has any influence on um, how people feel about the election and, and consequently um, their, their opinions of the electoral process. Um, and the third question uh, is uh, what consequences, if any, uh, do fears of uh, uh, electoral fraud have on uh, political behavior? So, um, oh, it's just bouncing around here. Uh, so I sort of have several, I don't know why it's <laughs> sort of, I'm not, I'm not doing anything, but the slides seem to be bouncing around a little bit. Uh, I'm, I apologize for that. I don't know necessarily what the problem is. Uh, so um, if I could just see about advancing this. Okay, so I have several expectations that are linked up to uh, those research questions. And um, one of the expectations uh, that we have is that electoral fraud, the concerns about this really have nothing to do with any specific concern. Uh, it's linked somewhat with what Justin had raised uh, earlier. Um, the difference is that we're asking um, citizens what they think and not electoral agents who probably have a lot more information about what's going on on the ground. Um, uh, similarly, uh, we, we expect that concerns about electoral integrity uh, are likely to be linked to electoral loss and that uh, and, and that losers are going to be uh, more likely to question um, the integrity of the process. Um, and then finally, on the subject of, uh, of violence, um, uh, in particular, uh, the, what, what transpired after the uh, 2020 election and the, and the riots in the Capitol um, uh, on January 8th, uh, we expect that Democrats, uh, because this has become somewhat of a partisan issue, uh, and that Republicans uh, took um, part in the violence, that Democrats are less likely to condone violence than Republicans, uh, particularly with respect to um, concerns about electoral fraud. Uh, and then in contrast to that, uh, we have an alternative expectation that Democrats are just likely to, uh, just as likely to condone violence as Republicans. Um, so in terms of our approach, um, like, uh, uh, like like Manu and, and Justin, uh, we um, have uh, a series of ex uh, survey experiments. Uh, these were uh, based on non-representative samples on Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which is a crowdsourcing uh, platform where basically um, you have people uh, that are uh, that complete tasks. And um, and so um, th th these are really non-representative samples. Um, and, and they're biased in, in some ways, which I'll, I'll mention in a moment. But what we're interested in is not to the extent to which we can generalize from these findings, but rather uh, the extent to which um, people exposed to certain information uh, react in a certain way. Uh, so the, the research uh, design is essentially based on uh, what we would call experiments or an experimental design. And uh, we conducted three different experiments, which I'll go through uh, in a moment. Uh, and um, basically what I'm going to present uh, are the findings from uh, surveys that were conducted over a period of time. Uh, we conducted one uh, survey um, following the 2020 election, uh, November 5th to 6th, which precedes the Capitol riots, and, uh, and then uh, three other studies uh, in the context of the midterm elections that took place um, in uh, November of 2022. So um, just to give you kind of an example, I, I just wanted to highlight that this is a very unrepresentative sample. It tends to be very biased toward uh, Democrats, for instance, and uh, and younger citizens. These are the people that are participating on Amazon Turk and 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 doing tasks in exchange for money. Now, 
we didn't pay them very much. We paid them about 10 cents uh, to complete an interview. Uh, so it's really not a lot of money, uh, particularly when the interview took about 12, 12 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes on average. So um, in any event, uh, uh, about 53% of the sample uh, were those who identify with the Democratic Party. We have a lot fewer Republicans in the sample, unfortunately, uh, about 31% and about 17% um, independents. And so just keep in mind that the, the, that, the, 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 the sample is skewed, okay? But again, we're not really interested necessarily in generalizing from these findings. Um, what, uh, what I'm interested in doing is looking at the effects of, um, of different uh, vignettes or uh, different treatments and and how these might influence um, uh, people's reactions. So, in this first experiment, uh, we had um, uh, basically uh, four groups. Actually, uh, three subjected to um, uh, a treatment. Now, these were randomly assigned. So, uh, for instance, if we had a sample of, say, just for the sake of argument, a thousand, uh, two hundred and fifty respondents would be randomly assigned to each one of these groups. So uh, we have three treatments and basically uh, one control group, uh, which uh, does not include the preamble. In, in we're asking uh, people about, um, uh, we're basically stating that there's some concern about integrity of elections and that some uh, people have suggested that voting uh, machines can be hacked. Uh, in the second treatment, we're suggesting that illegal aliens are, are voting in elections. And in the third treatment, uh, we're suggesting people are voting on behalf of others. So uh, ballot harvesting. Um, and then finally, the control doesn't state anything. It just says, to what extent do you think that fraud electoral, uh, shapes electoral outcomes? So, um, uh, so just to give you uh, some, uh, well, here are the results uh, from those four groups. Um, generally, and, and again, it's not necessarily, you can't generalize from these findings, but overall, uh, a majority uh, believe that fraud affects electoral outcomes. I believe Justin uh, also mentioned that a substantial proportion of the British electorate is also concerned about fraud, regardless whether or not it exists or not. Um, but when subjected to these different um, treatments, um, there's really no uh, discernible differences. I mean, there are some differences here, and uh, it appears that ballot harvesting uh, is more likely to increase concerns about fraud uh, than illegal aliens or voting machines. Um, but these are our small differences overall. Uh, so um, uh, when you look at this, I've, I've got a figure here uh, that tests for these statistical di differences between these groups. And uh, what we're looking for in, in the way to interpret this uh, figure is any lines that are that are not touching zero, basically. So you can see that uh, with respect to all those treatment um, conditions, that they're all touching uh, zero, um, uh, with the possible exception of one model on on voter uh, on voter harvesting. Um, in terms of partisanship, there's definitely a difference between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, you can see that the, as far as on the, on the Republican line, that it's away from zero, it's positive, which indicates that Republicans are more likely to believe um, that fraud uh, is affecting electoral outcomes than independents, which are the reference category. But there's no difference between Democrats and independents. And finally, uh, the thing that emerges here, and this is a consistent finding, um, we looked at other things, is that concerns about um, that people who believe in conspiracy uh, theory is an extremely strong predictor of attitudes about electoral fraud, which suggests that um, there's something else going on here and that these fears might be very well misplaced. Uh, so you can see that um, I, th I think the question, uh, the way we measured conspiracy is um, whether or not COVID um, was released a foreign government uh, deliberately uh, and uh, electoral uh, fraud experiment. Um, just waiting for it to come up. Uh, so in, in another way we sort of looked at this forward, 
aspect of this was we um, uh, we framed a, a, a question in, in in terms of suggesting that uh, that um, Republicans uh, fear that Biden stole the election in 2020. Uh, if you remember this, this is something that uh, President Trump has emphasized that the uh, that the election was stolen from him. Uh, so uh, we're, we're sort of presenting a random uh, third of respondents with this uh, notion that the, the election was stolen. Uh, and then uh, in another group, we're suggesting that Trump stole the election in 2016 from the Democrats. Um, and and then finally, the control group is uh, no mention at all of of who of, of whether or not an election was stolen. Uh, so, looking at these results, um, uh, th th there's really th there's very few differences again uh, in the proportion that uh, would say elections are fair. So, in this case, mo while while a lot of people tend to agree that um, electoral fraud is a problem. Uh, they generally agree that elections are fair. You might think that that is that these things are not the same, uh, but uh, they're clearly measuring uh, perhaps two different things. Um, uh, but even those uh, who were exposed to Trump stealing an election, uh, only 13 percent of them uh, believe that elections are never fair in America uh, con uh, compared to the control group, which is about 8 percent. So there's a little bit of an effect there. And uh, I have the same kind of statistical analysis here, uh, where you can see that those lines, uh, at least for people who uh, stole the Trump election, um, that were exposed to that frame, uh, are just a little bit away from zero, which suggests that it's statistically significant. But there's really no, in this case, no differences, no partisan differences. So the final um, experiment um, uh, tries to get at sort of this notion about winning and losing. Um, to separate, because we know, for instance, that uh, in some cases, Republicans um, uh, are more concerned about uh, fraud in the United States. And similarly, in the, in the UK, uh, those on the right uh, are perhaps more concerned about it. So we're trying to determine whether or not this might be an ideological thing um, or may, whether it actually is linked to winning and losing. So... Uh, in the 2020 midterm election, uh, it kind of presented a unique opportunity to test uh, a theory about winning and losing, um, uh, because it, uh, after the election, the results were not clear. And it wasn't clear whether or not the Democrats had retained control of Congress, of the House of Representatives, or the Senate, or whether they lost it. Um, I think going into the election is widely predicted that the Republicans were going to recapture control of both chambers. Uh, but in the end, um, as, and surprisingly, um, the Democrats managed to keep control of the Senate uh, just barely, and they just lost the House of Representatives, I think, by four seats. Again, it was expected that they would lose uh, in, 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 in many more seats than that. So uh, what we did was in that context of not knowing what the election was, we presented uh, people with different treatments. Uh, and in one case, um, we suggested that the Democrats uh, had done better than expected and would maintain control of both the House and the Senate. Whereas in another treatment uh, group, uh, we uh, stated that the Republicans um, had uh, uh, would would likely uh, take control of the House and the Senate. Uh, and in what we're calling a sort of a control group uh, was we, we basically said it wasn't, um, it was too close to call. And so we asked people what their feelings about the election were. And um, we had sort of a variety of, of different uh, uh, responses uh, ranging from happy and excited uh, to worried, depressed, angry, disgusted, and nervous. So we tried to sort of divide these up. And um, I, um, uh, uh, two percent were happy percent did uh, so the majority of the survey more than republicans uh, um that 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 we would have so many people happy these are the results um basically and they're sort of interesting for the long are away from zero and um and and particularly 
uh, we're interested in in how the treatments affected different um, uh, uh, different people. Uh, so uh, Republicans who were treated essentially with the Democratic win, uh, in other words, they were randomly assigned to that frame, are more likely to be upset uh, by the uh, the outcome. Uh, than those exposed to different frames, which suggests that that really that losing an election can actually influence um, people's uh, uh, opinions and emotions. This might seem fairly obvious, uh, but um, but I've, I've yet to see a, a convincing demonstration of it. Um, so this is this is some evidence to suggest that uh, uh, that that winning and losing does have an effect. Uh, those people who have college degrees and who are white uh, are 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 happier and excited uh, than uh, than others. Uh, and and interestingly, women uh, were more likely to be upset um, uh, than um, uh, than men. So uh, sort of moving on, um, and I, I realize we're we're probably running out of time, but um, I just want to get to the third. Um, uh, uh, question here is this question about what consequence all of this has. And um, we asked people uh, the extent to which they agreed or disagreed with um, uh, various um, forms of political behavior, uh, ranging from sending threatening messages to people or participating in violent protests or sending money to violent groups. Uh, or participating in, in, in peaceful gatherings. Not surprisingly, uh, most people would condone participating in peaceful gatherings. What we found to be surprising is that we found so many people willing uh, or a, a, a exactly agreeing uh, with uh, people um, with sending threatening messages and participating in violent protests uh, or sending money to violent groups, which was a, somewhat of a concern. Um, uh, we we asked these questions as I as I suggested at the beginning, um, in the context of the 2020 presidential election, and again in 2022, uh, and I want to just highlight that we asked these questions before the Capitol riots, so we asked sort of a range of questions um, uh, about when would violence be justified, and uh, and we tried to sort of compare you know, uh, cases where someone's life is in danger or defense against foreign uh, adversaries to concerns about preserving the integrity of an election. And so not surprisingly, you know, many people would agree uh, that violence is justified in cases of, of defense, national defense, or protecting one's life. But surprisingly, we found a substantial proportion of people who believe that violence is necessary to uh, preserve the integrity of the election and to protect one's values. So the question is, well, are, are Republicans just more likely to engage or condone violence than, than Democrats? And what we found uh, was that uh, both Democrats and Republicans are more likely uh, than, than independents uh, to condone violence uh, on a number of different um, um um, forms of violence. The exception is uh, in these two more serious cases, defending the, the country against foreign adversaries or protecting one's life. In, in those cases, uh, Democrats are a little less likely actually uh, to believe that violence is justified in the case of defending the country. Um, uh, and there's very few differences um, with respect to re uh, uh, Republicans and independents on that question or protecting one's life. But on these other questions, uh, both Democrats and Republicans seem to be willing to condone violence. And finally, um, just comparing 2020 uh, to 2022, uh, there, there's very few differences. So while we're talking about non-representative samples here, uh, we don't really find any um, any differences between uh, the two elections, which um, which uh, which we find find interesting. So um, I'll leave it there. That's uh, that's basically what I have. Um, uh, just to just to you know sum up the findings, um, there, there's really not any evidence that electoral fraud is linked to any specific concerns, um, and and that it's it's probably fairly diffuse. Uh, conspiracy theory is a very strong predictor. Um, and in terms of its effect on violence, it seems like um, there is a strong connection or potential connection uh, between uh, people's willingness to uh, 
uh, beliefs in fraud and willingness to engage in violence. Thank you. I hope I didn't go too long. No, no, that's 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 great. Okay, yeah, uh, th thank you, Jeff.